Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens, dramatised in ten episodes by Betty Davis. Part 9, The Mark of Cain. When his grandfather, at Mr Pecksniff's direction, dismissed him so finally that all hope of a reconciliation seemed gone, Martin was left in a stupor that held him fixed to the spot. On seeing this, the obsequious Mr Pecksniff offered his arm, old Mr Chuzzlewit took it, and they retired from the room. Martin woke to the realisation that he was face to face with Mary again, and, apart from Mark, alone with her. Mary! Martin! Oh. oh, my dearest girl. He hasn't changed you. You bore so much, you restrained yourself so nobly. Restrained myself? You were there, and I knew you hadn't changed. What more could I ask? But we have only a few moments, and they're precious. Tell me, is it true that Pecksniff has been persecuting you with his addresses? He has, as far as he can, still does. Oh, but Martin, I've been so unhappy, so anxious about you. Why didn't you write? We were both very ill. <gasps> the truth would have hurt you more than the uncertainty, and it would have been impossible to hide it. But, Pecksniff, does my grandfather know that he's been pursuing you? Yes. Does he support him? No. Oh, thank heaven. He said, I knew what stood in Pecksniff's favour. He was moderately rich, of good repute, and high in Martin's confidence and friendship. Oh. But when he saw how distressed I was, he said he wouldn't try to control my inclinations, and he would never refer to it again, nor has he. The man himself? Has had few opportunities. I've taken care never to be alone with him again. Good. Oh, dear Martin, I must tell you that your grandfather is kinder to me than ever. I, I can't abandon him, even for you. I wouldn't ask you to, dearest. But it seems to me that the influence this fellow exercises over him has increased. Yes, it has. Now it is supreme. I have no influence. Although he he shows me more affection than he ever did in the past. Is he... is he afraid of Pecksniff? Well, I, I fancied just now he was timid of asserting his own opinions in the man's presence. I've sometimes thought so. Often, when we're sitting alone, he's been talking quite cheerfully. But when Pecksniff comes in, he always changes to what you've just seen. He defers to him in everything and has no opinions of his own. <clears throat> Sir, I think we should go. He's coming back. Yes. Goodbye, my dearest. Goodbye. Oh, please, please write. I will. I'll write from London. I hope to do great things there. A short interview after such an absence. But we're well out of the house. We might have placed ourselves in a false position by staying. I don't know about ourselves, sir. But somebody else would have gotten to a false position if he'd come back while we was there. <laughs> oh, sorry, sir. Now, who was that as wasn't looking where he was going? I don't know. But his face seems familiar. He's going into Pecksniff's house. And he's a-staring pretty hard at us. He better not waste his beauty, for he ain't got much to spare. Jonas, is my child well? There's nothing the matter. Oh, she's well enough. There's nothing the matter with her. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, fie upon my weakness. Oh, I cannot help it. I am better now. How is my other child, my eldest, my cherry weary Chigo? And much the same as usual. She sticks pretty close to the vinegar bottle. Uh, you know she's got a sweetheart, I suppose. I have heard of it from my child herself. It is a sphere which Cherry will adorn. She need adorn some sphere or other, for she ain't very ornamental in general. <coughs> my girls are now happily provided for, and I have not laboured in vain. I suppose we talk about something else for a change. Are you agreeable? Quite Ah, oh, you wag, you naughty wag. <laughs> you laugh at poor old fond papa. Well, he deserves it, and he don't mind it, for his feelings are their own reward. 
Have you come to stay with me? No, I've uh, got a friend with me. Well, bring your friend. Bring any number of your friends. Uh, this ain't the sort of man to be brought. Thank you, but he's a little too near the top of the tree for that. Indeed? I'll tell you what you may do, if you like. Come and dine with us at the Dragon. We were forced to come down to Salisbury last night on some business, and I got him to bring me over here this morning. Hmm. But mind what you're about. He only mixes with the best. Some young nobleman who's been borrowing money from you at good interest? <laughs> borrowing, indeed. When you're a twentieth part as rich as he is, you may shut up shop. Since I was lucky enough and sharp enough to get a share in the assurance office he's president of, I've made... Well, yes, well, never mind what I've made. You know me pretty well, and I didn't blab about such things, but, eh, God, I've made a trifle. Hmm. Really, my dear Jonas, a gentleman like this should receive some attention. Would he like to see the church? Huh? Or if he has a taste for the fine arts, I can send him a few portfolios. Salisbury Cathedral is an edifice suggestive of the loftiest emotions. We have drawings of this celebrated structure from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, <laughs> from the south east, from the north west. <laughs> Pecksniff, if I knew how you mean to leave your money, I could put you in the way of doubling it in no time. It wouldn't be bad to keep a chance like this snug in the family. My dear Jonas, by far the greater part of my inconsiderable savings is already given, demised and bequeathed to a person whom I cannot, whom I will not, whom I need not name. No. I'll uh, keep my own counsel, but if you like I'll leave your card for Mr Montague by way of usher for yourself at dinner time. <coughs> a delightful repast, delightful. Now, Mr. Montague, if you'll allow me, I would like to propose a toast. By all means, my dear sir. I wish to drink to the health of my young kinsman, your young friend, Mr. Jonas here. Ah, <laughs> Mr. Jonas. <laughs> <sighs> Obliged to you, I'm sure. I congratulate him on the valuable and distinguished friendship he has formed, and I have to say, I envy him his usefulness to his fellow creatures. For, as I have understood the objectives of that institution to which he is newly connected, the Anglo-Bengali, did you say? Yes, the Anglo-Bengali. As I have understood the objectives of the Anglo-Bengali, they are calculated to do good. For my part, if I could, in any way, promote them, I would lay my head on my pillow at night in the certainty of untroubled and blameless repose. Am I to understand, Mr Pecksniff, that you might be interested in joining us? Oh, a, a casual remark, Mr Montague. It, it fell from me quite accidentally. But now you mention it, let me consider. Yes, indeed. I would be interested in pursuing the matter further. I, I can tell you that there'd never be a better time to invest than now. You will make, uh, if you'll excuse the vernacular, a packet. Mm. If you wish, I can demonstrate to you how certain, how infallible your chances of profit would be. I mm? have the papers with me. Oh, why, Mr Montague, that would indeed be most kind. Books? Papers, statements, calculations of various kinds were soon spread out before them, and as they were all framed with one object, it is not surprising that they all tended to one end. It was nearly midnight before the party broke up, and by then it had been agreed that Mr Pecksniff was to become the last partner and proprietor in the Anglo-Bengalee, and that he would dine with Mr Montague at Salisbury on the next day but one to complete the negotiation and sign the appropriate papers. The sum he was to invest was nearly equal to Mr Pecksniff's whole hoard, not counting Mr Chuzzlewit, whom he looked upon as money in the bank, the possession of which inclined him the more to make a dash with his own private sprats for the capture of such a whale as Mr Montague described. You mean to wait at Salisbury over the day after tomorrow, do you? You heard our appointment. In any case, I should have wanted to see after the boy. You don't want me, I suppose. I want you to put your name here. 
I may as well have your note of hand for that extra capital. If you wish to go home, I can manage Mr. Pecksniff alone now. What, not a day's grace, not a day's trust after the pains I've taken? Tonight's work was part of our bargain. And so was this. Signed here. You drive a hard bargain. What, what the devil's this? It's bloody. You've used the red ink. What? Oh, give me the other bottle. And the other pen. Black enough this time. Right. Good night. How do you mean to get away from here? <laughs> I'll cross early in the morning to the high road before you're out of bed and catch the day coach. You're in a hurry? Hmm. I have something to do. All the better. I shall travel home alone. Tom Pinch and his sister had formed a little plot that Tom should always come out of the temple one way, by the fountain, where he was pretty certain to find Ruth coming to meet him. What was his surprise when, one particular afternoon, he found his little sister in company with his good friend John Westlock, who had just happened to be passing through Fountain Court at the same time, an accidental encounter that made Tom exclaim with pleasure and Ruth, for some unaccountable reason, blush. It bore pleasant fruit in the shape of an invitation to dine at John's chambers, where they partook of an excellent meal of salmon, lamb, innocent young potatoes, a tender duckling, and a tart. But for some reason, John was very pathetic on the subject of his dreary life in these bachelor chambers. When the dinner was over, Ruth prompted Tom to relate what had passed at London Bridge that morning. Hmm... Well, what do you make of it? I shall speak to Mr. Nadgett, of course. Oh, he's uh, our landlord. Though he's an odd, secret man, not likely to afford me much satisfaction, even if he knew what was in the letter. Which you may be sure he did. You think so? Yes, do you? I'm certain of it, Miss Pinch. Well, he goes in and out in a strange way, but... Well, I'll try to catch him tomorrow morning and, and remonstrate with him for giving me such an unpleasant commission. Mm. And, and I've been thinking that if I went down to Mrs. Todgers in the city, where I was before... I might find poor Mercy Chuzzlewit there and be able to explain to her how I came into the business. Yes, you're quite right. See her husband too, if you can, and yes. wash your hands of the whole affair by a plain statement of the facts. I have a misgiving there's something dark at work here, Tom. Tom, dear, are you sure Mrs Chuzzlewit will want to see me? Oh, of course I am. She was so glad to see me, and, and your sympathy is sure to be much more delicate and acceptable than mine. Oh, but look! What? Isn't that the other Miss Pecksniff looking in the window of that furniture warehouse? Oh! Oh, yes, it is. And she's with that young gentleman to whom she's going to be married. <laughs> Why does he look as if he was going to be buried? <laughs> he seems a dismal young gentleman, but he, he's very civil and inoffensive. Why? Oh. Upon my word, <laughs> Mr Pinch and yes. his sister. How do you do? May I... Mr. Augustus Model, uh, Miss Pinch. How do you do? You know Mr. Pinch already. Oh, yes, indeed. My dear girl, I never was so ashamed in my life. I mind your brother less than anybody else, but the indelicacy of meeting any gentleman under such circumstances. Uh, which way are you going, Mr. Pinch? Uh, we were going to Mrs. Todgers to see if we could find your sister. Oh, well, she isn't there. Oh. But let me take you to her house. Augustus, no. Mr. Model... I mean, and myself are on our way to tea there. Ah, uh, well, are you sure I oh, should... Oh, you be... needn't think of him. He is not at home. Uh, but really, I must beg you two gentlemen to walk on and allow me to follow with Miss Pinch. Of course. Come, Mr. Model. Of course, my love. It would be useless for me to disguise after what you have seen that I am about to be united to the gentleman who is walking with your brother. What do you think of him? Pray, let me have your candid opinion. He seems a most eligible young man. I am curious to know whether you have observed that he is of a rather melancholy turn. Well, it did seem to me that he looked rather low. Really? That's remarkable. Everybody says the same. What do you think can be the cause of his depression? I really have no idea. My dear, 
I shouldn't wish it to be known, but I don't mind mentioning it to you, having known your brother for so many years. I refused Augustus three times, and he has never recovered from that cruelty, for it was cruel. I look back on my conduct now with blushes. I always liked him. I felt it was not to me what the crowd of young men who had made proposals had been, but something very different. Then what right had I to refuse him three times? It was a severe trial of his fidelity. My dear, it was wrong. Let me be a warning to you. Don't try the feelings of anyone who makes you an offer as I have tried the feelings of Augustus. Think what my feelings would have been if I had goaded him to suicide and it had got into the papers. Oh, my neck, cab! Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yes. I wonder that in these crowded streets the foot passengers aren't run over more often. The drivers won't do it. Uh, do you mean that well, there are some men who can't get run over? Hmm? They live a charmed life. Coal wagons recoil from them. Even cabs refuse to run them down. <laughs> there are such men. Yes. One of them is a friend of mine. Why, goodness me, Mrs. Chuzzlewit, <laughs> to think that I should see beneath this individual roof identically coming Mr. Pinch. Oh, yeah. I take the liberty, though almost unbeknownst, and the smilingest and sweetest <laughs> face, except in yours, Mrs. Chuzzlewit, and your good lady too, uh, Mr. Model, which me and another friend of mine took notice of among the packages London Bridge. Oh, yes. Oh, ain't we rich in beauty this here joyful afternoon? I knows another sitch lady too, which her name I'll not deceive you, Mrs. Chuzzlewit, is uh, Harris. Harris, yes. And often have I said to Mrs. Harris, oh, Mrs. Harris, ma'am, your countenance is quite an angel's, which but for pimples it would be. <laughs> Rouse yourself and look up, Mr. Chuffy. Here's company. I'm sorry for it. I know I'm in the way. I ask pardon, but I've nowhere else to go. Where is she? Here. I'm here, Mr. Chuffy. Ah, here she is. She's never hard on poor old Chuffy. Oh, poor old Chuff. Never mind him. He'll die one day. Oh, the tea, Mum. Oh. Put it on the side table, Eliza. Um, Mrs. Gamp, will you pour tea for us? Oh, indeed I will, ma'am. And quite a family to pour tea for. <laughs> and what a happiness to do it. Eliza, my good young woman, perhaps somebody would like to try a new laid egg or two. Uh, not far too hard. Likewise, a few rounds of butter toast. First cutting off the crust in consequence of tender teeth. <laughs> and not too many of them. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Gamp. There, now then. That's it. And another one. Who's lying dead upstairs? No one. What, what's the matter? We're all here. All here. All here. Oh, where is he then, my old Hush. master, Mr. Chuzzlewit, who had the only son? Where is he? Hush, that happened long ago, don't you recollect? Recollect, as if I ever could forget. Who's lying dead upstairs? No one. Oh, you think not, but they don't tell you, poor thing. Foul play, there's someone dead or dying. Where's Jonas? In the country. Oh, they don't tell you. They don't tell me either. But I'll watch. Oh, they shan't hurt you. Why, I teach, I teach. Is these your manners? You want a pitcher of water thrown over you to bring you round. That's my belief. He's quiet now, Mrs. Gamp. Don't disturb him. Oh, bother the old victim, Mrs. Chuzzlewit. I ain't got no patience with him. Come here. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. There now. If you should turn at all faint, we can soon revive you, sir, I promise. Bite a person's thumbs or turn their fingers the wrong way and they comes too wonderful. 
Lord bless you. Ah, oh, Mr. Pinch, it all comes of this unfortunate marriage. If my sister had not united herself to a wretch, there would have been no Mr. Chuffey in the house. Shh! She'll hear you. I'd be very sorry if she did hear me, for it is not my nature to add to the uneasiness of any person, far less my own sister. Augustus, my dear child, find my pocket handkerchief and give it to me. Please, Augustus. Very well. Yes. Uh, uh, Ruth, yes, I, I think it's time for us to go. Yes, Tom. And uh, Mrs. Chuzzlewit, oh. I'll write to your husband and explain to him, as, as I would have done if I'd met him in here, that if he's sustained any inconvenience through my means, it, it's not my fault. Oh. <laughs> that, that, that will be Jonas. Oh, well, perhaps I'd better not meet him on the stairs. I, I, I'll wait for him here. Uh, Jonas... Oh. I didn't know you'd got a party. Pray don't let us intrude on your domestic happiness. Augustus, my love, we will uh, go. Yes, it would be a pity to spoil the bliss this gentleman always brings with him, especially into his own oh, home. Charity, charity. Mercy, my dear, I am obliged to you for your advice, but I am not his slave. Nor wouldn't have been if you could. <laughs> yes, we all know about that. What did you say? Didn't you hear? I'm not going to say it again. If you like, stay, and if you like, go. But if you stay, please be civil. Beast! Augustus, come away, child. I command you. Oh, yes, but... but, 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 but. Oh! Uh, Mr. Chuzzlewit. Hell and damnation, you here! Jonas. You, you have no cause to speak so violently. Though what I wish to say relates to your own affairs, I know nothing of them and desire to know nothing of them. I, I gave you a letter the other day. You thief, you did. And I'll pay you for the carriage of it one day and settle an old score besides. Now, I, I want you to understand that I am no party to the contents of that letter. I, I know nothing of it. I was not even aware that it was to be delivered to you. I, I had it from... By the Lord, I'll knock your brains out if you speak another uh, word. I had it from Mr... Mm. Oh! <laughs> Jonas, stop! Oh. Um, Mr. Pinch, please leave. For the love of heaven, leave. Uh, please. Yes. Yes, I will. For your sake. Come, Ruth. Um... So, these are your friends when I'm away, are they? You plot and tamper with people of this sort? No, I know nothing of these secrets. I, I, I don't know what they mean. Since I left home, I've seen him but once. Twice. Oh, before today. once, twice. What do you mean? Three times? How many are lying? No Jenny? more. The, the other morning, today, and one besides. Listen to me, young lady. And don't whine when you have no occasion, or I may make one for you. If I find him in my house again, or find you have seen him in anybody else's house, you'll repent it. If you're not deaf and dumb to everything that concerns me, unless you have my leave to hear and speak, you'll repent it. If you don't obey exactly what I order, you'll repent it. Now attend. What's the time? It has just struck eight. I have been travelling day and night and am tired. I have lost some money and that don't improve me. Put my supper in the little off room below and have the truckle bed made. I shall sleep there tonight and maybe tomorrow night. And if I can sleep all day tomorrow, so much the better. Keep the house quiet and don't call me, mind. Don't call me and don't let anyone call me. Let me lie there. Yes, yes, Jonas, is that, is that all? All what? Must you pry and question? Uh, what more do you no, want to know? Nothing, Jonas, but what you tell me. All hope of confidence between us has long deserted me. Ecard, I should hope so. But if you tell me what you wish, I will be obedient and try to please you. I, I make no merit of that. I've no friend in my father or my sister. I, I'm quite alone. Mm. I, I am very humble and submissive, Jonas. You told me you'd break my spirit. And you have. Do not break my heart, too. She ventured, as she said this, to lay her hand on his shoulder. He suffered it to rest there in his exultation, and the whole mean, sordid, pitiful soul of the man looked at her for the moment through his wicked eyes. She left to see to his instructions. He was brooding in the armchair when Mrs. Gamp came in to tell him that the little room was ready. She affected a deep solicitude for Mr. Chuffey. How is he, sir? Who? Oh, 
to be sure what am I thinking of? You weren't here, sir, when he was took so strange. A chuffy? Yes. The creature's head was so hot you might eat a flat iron on it. And no wonder, considering the things he said. What did he say? The awfulest things as ever I heard. He comes to ask who's lying dead upstairs and where was Mr Chuzzlewit as had the only son. And he whispers softly about foul play. He gives me such a turn as I could never have kept myself up but for a little drain of spirits, which I seldom touches but could always wish to know where to find, if so disposed, never knowing what may happen next, the world being so uncertain. Uh, the old fool's mad. That's my opinion, sir. I believe Mr Chuffy requires attention, if I may make so bold, and should not have his liberty to wax and worry your sweet lady as he does. I call you right. I've half a mind to shut him up. Uh, could you take care of uh, such an idiot mm -hmm. in some spare room upstairs? Uh, me and a friend of mine... One off, one on, could do it. Me and Betsy Prigg, sir, would undertake Mr Chuffy reasonable. Betsy Prigg has nussed a many lunacies, and well she knows their ways, mm. which putting them right closer for the fire when fractious is the certainest and most composing. Leave matters to Betsy and me, sir. Mm. We'll see to him. Mm. Mr. Chuff, it'll be pretty easy to be even with you, old dog. He shall be gagged. He looked at his watch and descended to the little room prepared for him. There he pulled off his coat and boots, put them outside the door and locked it. Then he sat down to his supper and began to eat with great rapacity, not like a hungry man, but as if he were determined to do it. He got softly into bed, tossed from side to side to tumble it, and then arose, and took from his portmanteau the smock and leggings of a country labourer. In these he dressed himself, then he waited for the onset of night. Soon it was dark, and the darkness seemed to creep over his face and slowly change it till it was black night within and without. The little room on the ground floor had a door in the wall opening into a narrow blind alley that had an outlet in a neighbouring street. Cautiously he turned the rusty key in the lock, looked out, passed through, and locked the door after him. All was clear and quiet as he fled away. Coachman, let me down here. Hey. I said, let me down here. We're well short of Salisbury. Never mind, it's daylight now, and I may get down where I please, I suppose. Uh, you got up to please yourself, and may get down to please yourself. We'll break our hearts to lose you, and it wouldn't have broken them if we'd never found you. Come on, where's your money, then? There it be. What are you staring at? Not a handsome man. If you want your fortune told, I'll tell you a bit of it. You won't be drowned. That's one consolation for you. Be damned. <laughs> Out of the way, you surly dog. Get up! Curse him. <laughs> but he took me for an ill-conditioned country fellow. That's good. That's good. He went on his way well satisfied with his disguise. As he walked, he tore out from a fence a thick, hard-knotted stake and spent some time in peeling off the bark and fashioning its jagged head with his knife. The day passed, noon, afternoon, and at last, evening. In the yard of the inn where Pecksniff and Montague were dining, Jonas, waiting in the shadows, heard their orders given. Montague would ride part of the way home with his guest and then return on foot. He knew well the route they would take. Uh, 
It's too soon, much too soon. But this is the place, my dear sir. Keep the path and go straight through the little wood you'll come to. The path is narrower there, but you can't miss it. When shall I see you again? Soon, I hope. I hope so. Good night. Good night, and a pleasant ride. Montague was flushed with wine, but not gay. His scheme had succeeded, but he showed no triumph. Perhaps the effort of sustaining his difficult part had fatigued him. Perhaps a shadowy veil was dropping round him, closing out all thoughts but the vague foreknowledge of impending doom. He took the footpath. It brought him to the wood, a close, thick, shadowy wood, through which the path went winding on. He paused before entering it, as if the stillness of the spot had almost daunted him. Then he went on, entered the wood, and slowly disappeared. No man saw him alive again. No man, save one. He lay as he had fallen, in a thick, solitary spot among the leaves, sopping and soaking, oozing down into the boggy ground as if to cover itself from human sight, went a dark, dark stain that dyed the whole summer night from earth to heaven. Do we wait for the coach, mister? What's that of you? Nothing. Nothing. Fine night. And a rare sunset. I didn't see it. Mm. Didn't see it? How the devil could I if I were asleep? I'm asleep. Aye. Aye. What's that? I can't say I'm sure. Here, you can finish this. Oi. And that settles my score. Right? The knocking had come as he was thinking of the closed-up room, the possibility of their knocking at the door, bursting it open and finding it empty. He could not sit still and hear it. On the night coach, dread and fear came upon him to an extent he had not counted on and could not manage in the least degree. He was horribly afraid of that infernal room at home. What if a monstrous, insane fear... The murdered man were there waiting for him. The dawn came. It was five o'clock and the London streets were deserted. He crept back to his door, turned the key, entered, and cast a fearful glance all round. There was nothing there. Lying down and burying himself once more beneath the blankets, he heard his own heart beating. Murder. 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 <laughs> Who's there? Mercy. Oh, come in. Come in. What o'clock is it? Nine. Uh, did, uh, did uh, no one knock at my door yesterday? Something disturbed me. No, no one. Oh, good. Mr. Nagett wanted to see you, but I told him you were tired and had asked not to be disturbed, so he went away. Now that's of little consequence. Has he been again? No. Oh, when I opened my window this morning very early, I saw him pass along the street, but he didn't call. Very early? What time? Uh, I don't know. It was first light. What can he want? Be damned to him! Jonas trembled to think that this man... Even this man, who had no object but to avoid people, might have seen him. And whatsoever guard he kept on himself that day, he could not help listening and showing that he listened. For he knew what must come, and his present punishment and torture and distraction 
were to listen for its coming. Hush! Oh, it's early in the morning for visitors. Oh, I, I, I suppose it must be John. I, I don't think it was his knock. Come in! Good gracious heavens! Martin! Martin, my, my dear old friend! Oh, how good it is to see you! Mark Tapley, too! My dear Mark! Oh, come in! How are you? He don't look a day older than he used to do at the dragon! <laughs> oh, my dear Martin! Oh, sit down, sit down! Um, uh, Thank you. My sister Ruth, Martin. Um, Mr. Chuzzlewick, my love. Good morning, Mr. Chuzzlewick. Good morning, Miss Pinch. <laughs> And, and, and Mark Tapley from the Dragon. Mr. Tapley, good morning. Morning, miss. <laughs> good gracious me, what a surprise. <laughs> well, sit down and take some breakfast. Oh, make him sit down and take his breakfast, Martin. <laughs> oh, I gave him up long ago as incorrigible. You'd excuse him, Miss Pinch, if you knew his value. Oh, bless you, she does know it. I've told her all about Mark Tapley, haven't I, Ruth? Yes, Tom. <laughs> Not all. The best of Mark Tapley is only known to one man, Tom. And but for Mark, he wouldn't be alive to tell it. Here you are, Mark. Thank you, miss. I can never thank you enough, Tom, for your faithful stewardship in the trust I left with you. Oh! No, when I add Mary's thanks to mine, I've made the only poor acknowledgement in our power. But I cannot tell you how much we both feel. I... I, I, I did little enough. Oh, Martin, tell me, what are your prospects? No longer to make your fortune, Tom. Just to try to live. I tried that once in London and failed. If you'll give me your advice, as a friend, I may succeed better this time. I'll do anything. Anything to earn my living by my own exertions. My hopes don't soar above that now. Oh, yes, they do. How can you talk so? They soar up to the time when, when you'll be able to claim her and, and be happy with her. Of course I'd give you advice, but you shall have better advice than mine. We'll consult John Westlock. It's early. I, I can take you to his chambers on my way to work and, and leave you there. Why, Tom, good morning. Good morning. Good heavens, who is this with you? Mark Tapley. Yes. Morning, sir. <laughs> and, and Mr. Chuzzlewick. Well, come in, come in. D D John, we want your good advice. Oh, you're engaged. Well, I'll, I'll come back no, later. No, I, um, I am engaged, but the truth is the matter on which I'm engaged demands your knowledge more than mine. My knowledge? Yes, it concerns a member of your family, and it is serious. If I may speak to you privately, you shall judge its importance for yourself. Well, in the meantime, I, I really must take myself off. It's your, it's your business so important that you can't stay for half an hour. What is your business, Tom? I'm afraid I'm, I'm not at liberty to say what it is. I, I don't know why, but well, this secrecy is at the request of my employer. It's awkward, but I can't help it, can I, John? No, you can't. I'll bear witness to that. <laughs> don't say another word, then. Goodbye, Tom. <laughs> I'll report to you later. I'll come with you, Mr Pinch, sir, unless that's out of order, too. No, no, not at all. You can come with me part of the way, as far as Fleet Street. Um, I'll call back for you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Tom. Now, Mr Chuzzlewit, would you excuse me for one moment? I have a visitor in the other room. I must apprise him of your presence, and then I will ask you to come in and hear what he has to say. Please, sit down. This man's name is Lucem. He was seized with an illness at the Bull Inn near here, and as we were at school together, I had an interest in his recovery. Before he left the inn, he told me he had a secret he wished to disclose to me, and a few days past, I had a letter from him, telling me it related to a person called Jonas Chuzzlewit. What? Yes, your relative. So I heard his statement, and I want you to hear it too. Tell Mr. Chuzzlewit your story, Lucem. Sir, what relation was Mr. Anthony Chuzzlewit, who... who... Who died? What relation was he to me? He was my grandfather's brother. I fear... I fear he was murdered. My God. By whom? I fear by me. You? Not by my act, but by my means. Speak out. And speak the truth. It is the truth. But Why? let him tell his story in his own way. For the last few years, I've served as assistant to a general practitioner in the city. I was in his employment when I met Jonas Chuzzlewit. He is the principal in this crime. What do you mean? 
Don't you know he's Anthony Chuzzlewit's son? I do know. I, I've reason to know. I've often heard him wish his father dead. We used to meet to drink and gamble, four or five of us. The sums we gambled were not large, but they were large to us, and he generally won. He lent money at interest to the losers, and though we secretly hated him, he came to be the master of us all. One night he came in in a very bad humour. He and I were alone. I've had a bad day. My father cursed the old devil. What has he done? He's in his second childhood. He's becoming a drivelling imbecile. He caught it without the patience of the whole calendar of saints. He tries you hard, does he? He tries me hard. He tries everyone hard. He'd be better dead. He's got as unbearable to himself as he is to other people. It would be a charity to put him out of the way. Come, sir, you don't mean what you're saying. Don't I, by God? I've often thought of mixing something with the stuff he takes for his cough. That would help him to die easily. Folk bitten by mad dogs are smothered for their own sake. Why shouldn't these lingering old men be helped out of their troubles too? That was as far as it went that night. It may have been a week after that, perhaps less, perhaps more, that, that he spoke to me again. We were alone once more. It was before our usual hour of assembly. I... I think I went there to meet him. And I know he went there to meet me. He was there first. He was reading a newspaper. I sat opposite and close to him. He spoke to me without looking up. I want you to get me some drugs. Drugs? Yes. Two sorts. One that takes effect quickly. I want very little of that. And... Uh... And? And? A one that is slow and would not arouse suspicion. I want more of that. What do you want them for? Uh, no harm, no harm. Uh, to physic cats. But what's it to you? I can get them anyway, but it would be easier through you. I may not use them at all. You can forget what you owe me. And there's five pounds in it for you. If you think I'll use them to do harm, you're more of a fool than I took you for. I was going abroad to a distant country. I have since lost the appointment, as Mr Westlock knows, through my sickness. It was my only hope of salvation from ruin. No more was said that night, for the others came in, but the next night I... I gave him the drugs, and he gave me the money. We've never met since. I only know his poor old father died, just as he would have done from this cause, and that since then I've suffered intolerable misery. It's well deserved, I know, but nothing can describe it. Let him remain at hand, but for heaven's sake, keep him out of my sight. He will stay here. Come with me. You've heard his story. It is your concern more than mine. What should we do? I... I can't think it. It is so shocking, so, so terrible. I cannot yet grasp all it implies. No, no, I understand. Let us wait till Tom returns. He has an experience to tell you that may be connected with Lucim's story. So, you see, Tom, we may very well have solved your riddle for you, though you mm. little knew the solution would be so terrible. Someone else must know of Jonas's guilt. Someone else must have power over him, enough power to prevent him leaving the country. Mm. Have you seen your landlord yet? No. He's still not come home. Mm. Who was in the house when Anthony Chuzzlewit died? Um, Jonas mm. himself. Mr Pecksniff. <laughs> it's easy to foresee what view he would take. Jonas is his son-in-law. Anyone else? Oh, Chuffy, the clerk. What sort of man is he? Oh, very old. Wandering in his mind a little now. But I, I think we should speak to him. When I was at the house, he behaved very strangely. Hmm? He spoke of someone lying dead upstairs, and he murmured something about foul play. Uh, could we speak to him? Well, it would be difficult to do that without alarming him, hmm. or alarming Jonas. Is there anyone who has influence over him? Well, Mercy Chuzzlewit has, but... How could we use that poor girl to help trap her husband? 
Is there anyone else? There is. A nurse. An old woman called Sarah Gamp. Oh, yeah. She once had care of Mr Chuffey. Uh, well, she still has some control over him. Yeah. We must talk to her without delay. Oh, drat you, Betsy, don't be long. I can't bear to wait. Ah. Betsy Prigma. Why, it's only that there disappointing Swedel pipes. Yes, it's me. I've just come in, Mrs. Gamp. Well, what is it? Is the Thames afire and cooking its own fish? Why, what's the man been a doing? He's as white as any chalk. Come in here, Sari. Come in. What? You recollect young... Not what? young Wilkins. If young Wilkins' wife is... It is a dead should... body's wife. Bailey. Young Bailey. What's that chick been a doing of? He hasn't been a doing anything. He'll never do anything again. He's done for. He's killed. Killed? Oh. The first time I ever see that boy, I charged him too much for a red pole. I asked him three apens for a penny one because I was afraid he'd beat me down. But he didn't. And now he's dead. And I can't square the account even though it's only a halfpenny. <laughs> How did you come to hear it? It's in the papers. Oh. Everyone's talking about in it. In the papers? What happens then? <laughs> Uh, him and his master were upset on a journey and he was carried to Salisbury and was breathing his last when the account came away. That ain't all. His master can't be found. <gasps> the other manager of the office in the city, David Crimple, has gone off with the money and is advertised for with a reward on the walls. Mr Montague, poor Bailey's master... <laughs> What a clever boy he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's advertised for too. Their office is a smash and a swindle. But what's a life assurance office to a life? Don't you hear nothing of Mr Chuzzlewit in all this? No, nothing to speak of. Yeah. His name wasn't printed as one of the board, though some people say it was just going to be. He went to the city this morning and complained that he'd been swindled and they do say he looked like death. But what's his looks to me? He might have died and welcome 50 times and not been such a loss as Bailey. Ah, oh, you're talking about it, are you? Well, I hope you've got it over for aren't interested myself. My precious Betsy, how late you are. Well, it ain't no fault of me if poor worse people goes off dead when they least expect it. Come upstairs. I've got tea ready for you. Ah. There you are, Betsy. There's the pickled salmon. Ha! <laughs> I know what you wouldn't have a cucumber. Oh, Lord bless you. Betsy, prig your words is true. I quite forgot it. Forget anything else, did you? I thought it you might, so I, I bought a tuppenny salad on the way. There you are. Now, don't go a dropping none of your snuff on it. In gruel, mutton broth and that, it don't signify. It stimulates a patient. But I don't relish it myself. My Betsy Prig, how can you talk so? Ain't your patients always sneezing their heads off along of your snuff? What if they are? Nothing if they are, but don't deny it, Sarah. Who denies it? Who denies of it, Betsy? Nobody if you don't, Sarah. Mrs Prig had decided, wisely, that a quarrel can be taken up at any time, but a limited quantity of pickled salmon cannot. When the meal ended, Mrs Gamp produced a teapot, which contained something stronger than tea, and set out a couple of glasses. The ladies began, amicably enough, by drinking each other's health, but soon symptoms of inflammation began to appear in their noses, and possibly their tempers also. Ah, now, Sari, joining yes. business with pleasure. What is this case in which you wants me? Is it Mrs Harris? No, Betsy Prig, it ain't. I'm glad of that at any rate. Why oh, should you be glad of that? She's unbeknownst to you, except by hearsay. Well, it ain't her, it seems. So who is it? You've heard me mention a person I took care of when you and I were at the ball. Oh, Snuffy. Chuffy. Ah! Mr Chuffy, Betsy. 
is weak in his mind. Excuse me if I make remark that he may neither be so weak as people think, nor people may not think he is so weak as they pretend. Well, and what I knows, I knows, and what you don't, you don't. So do not ask me. But Mr. Chuffey's friends has made proposals for his being took care on, and has said to me, Mrs. Gamp, Will you undertake it at your own price, day and night, and by your own self? No, I says I will not. There is but one creature in the world as I would undertake on such terms, and her name is Harris. But my friend Betsy Prig, that I can recommend, will assist. Me. She's always to be trusted under me and will be guided as I could desire. Now, Betsy, it ain't your turn. Drink, fair, whatever you do. <coughs> Mrs. Harris, Betsy. Bother, Mrs. Harris. What? I don't believe there's no such person. Why, you beige creature. Have I known Mrs. Harris five than twenty years? To be told there ain't no such person. Oh. Have I stood her friend in all her troubles, great and small, to come at last to such an end as this? But, well, you mayn't believe there's no such a creature, for she wouldn't demean herself to look at you. Often as she said when I made mention of you, what, Sarah Gamp, debate yourself to her? Go along with you. I'm a-going, ain't I? You better, man. And you was a-going to eh? take me under, you oh, how kind. You state your imprints. What do you mean? Go along with you. I blush you, you. You better ya. blush a little for yourself, you and your chuffies. Ooh. What, a poor old creature isn't mad enough, isn't he? He's very soon be mad enough if you had anything to do with And that's what I was him. wanted for, is it? Yes. But you'll find yourself deceived. I won't go uh -oh. near him. We shall see how you get on without me. Yes. I won't have nothing to do with him. You never spoke a truer oh, word than that, oh, sexy oh, please. Oh, oh, oh. my life was a miss. The noise you ladies have been making, Mrs. Gamp. These two gentlemen have been standing on the stairs outside trying to make you hear while you were pelting away hammer and tongs. Oh, Mr. Sweet of Pipe. Mr. Westlock also, if my eyes do not deceive me, and a, a friend, uh, not having the pleasure of being be known. Uh, oh, what I have took from Betsy Prig this blessed night. If she had abused me being in liquor, which I thought I smelt on her when she come, I could have borne that with a thankful heart. But the words she spoke of Mrs. Harris Lambs could not forgive. <laughs> no, Betsy, no worms forget. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you to a gentleman. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Gamp, I'll tell you what we want presently when you've recovered. Oh, Mrs. Harris! Uh, have a little, um, tea? It ain't tea. Uh, physic of some sort, I suppose. Ha have a little. Oh, thank you. Oh, Oh, Betsy never has another stroke of work from me. Well, certainly not. She shall never help to nurse me. Do you think that she should ever have helped to nurse that friend of yours? And been so near of hearing things. Things? That was a narrow escape, Mrs. Gamp. Ah, narrow indeed. It was only my having the night and hearing his wanderings that saved it. What would she have said and done, that perfidious wretch? And you've always been so kind to her, too. Oh, that's where it hurts me, Mr. Westlock. She's chosen to help you with Mr. Lewsome, chosen to help you with Mr. Chuffy. Chose once, but chose no more. I don't think it ever would have done. There are regions in families for keeping things a secret. And who could reproach trust in Betsy Prig after her words of Mrs. Harris? I hope you've time to find another assistant. Which is short, 
Short it is indeed. Tomorrow evening I waits upon his friends. Uh, Mr. Chuzzlewit appointed it nine to ten. Nine to ten. And then Mr. Uh, Chuffy retires into safekeeping, does he? Yes, and he needs to be kept safe. Yes. Other people besides me has a happy deliverance from Betsy Prig. She'd have let it out. <laughs> let him out, you mean? <laughs> Do I? Oh. Oh, but I'm a keeping of you, you gentlemen, and time is... Um, it's precious. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, the tortoise, Betsy Prig and Flinties. Oh, frightful. Uh, good night. What shall we do now? Stay here. Mrs. Harris! You shall question Chuffy if you go as Mrs. Harris herself. Uh, what? You... We know enough to carry her our own way now. Let her sleep as long as she likes. And let Jonas Chuzzlewit look to himself. We shall gain our end in good time. In part nine of Charles Dickens's Martin Chuzzlewit, dramatized in ten episodes by Betty Davis, the part of Mrs. Gump was played by Patricia Hayes, Betsy Prigg, Pauline Letts, Jonas, Struan Roger, Tig Montague, Douglas Livingstone, Mr. Pecksniff, Christopher Benjamin. Martin Chuzzlewit, Valentine Pelker, Mark Tapley, Jonathan Taffler, Mary Graham, Zela Clark, Tom Pinch, David Collins, Ruth, Deborah Makepeace, John Westlock, Jonathan Cullen, Lucem, Eric Stovell. Charity, Angela Pleasance, Augustus Model, Bill Nye, Mercy, Susie Brown, Paul Sweetlepipe, Michael Graham Cox, Old Chuffy, Norman Jones, with Elaine Claxton, Brian Hewlett, and Gordon Reed. The narrator was Simon Cadell, and the director, Jane Morgan.